إذ قالوا لنبي له مبعث لنا ملكا نقاتل في سبيل الله قال هل عسيتم إن كتب عليكم القتال ألا تقاتلوا قالوا وما لنا ألا نقاتل في سبيل الله وقد أخرجنا من ديارنا وأبنائنا فلما كتب عليهم القتال تولوا إلا قليلا منهم والله عليم بالظالمين وقال لهم نبيهم إن الله قد بعث لكم طالوت ملكا قالوا أنا يكون له الملك علينا ونحن أحق بالملك منه ولم يؤت سعة من المال قال إن الله اصطفاه عليكم وزاده بسطة في العلم والجسم والله يؤتي ملكه من يشاء والله واسع عليم وقال لهم نبيهم إن آية ملكه أن يأتيكم التابوت فيه سكينة من ربكم وبقية مما ترك آل موسى وآل هارون تحمله الملائكة إن في ذلك لآية لكم إن كنتم مؤمنين فلما فصل طالوت بالجنود قال إن الله مبتليكم بنهر فمن شرب منه فليس مني ومن لم يطعمه فإنه مني إلا من اغترف غرفة بيده فشربوا منه إلا قليلا منهم فلما جاوزه هو والذين آمنوا معه قالوا لا طاقة لنا اليوم بجالوت وجنوده قال الذين يظنون أنهم ملاق الله كم من فئة قليلة غلبت فئة كثيرة بإذن الله والله مع الصابين ولما برزوا لجالوت وجنوده قالوا ربنا أفرغ علينا صبرا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين فهزموهم بإذن الله وقتل داود جالوت وآتاه الله الملك والحكمة وعلمه مما يشاء ولولا دفع الله الناس بعضهم ببعض لفسدت الأرض ولكن الله ذو فضل على العالمين تلك آيات الله نتلوها عليك بالحق وإنك لمن المرسلين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My topic for tonight is why do Bani Umayyah believe Ashura to be a happy celebration? And along with that, what was the implications now in the modern day? And going along with that, what do we as the Shia of Ahlul Bayt need to do to stop these stories? To begin, why do Bani Umayyah believe Ashura to be a happy day, a celebration? After the heinous killing of Imam Hussein, Bani Umayyah began spreading stories. Just like a child, when a child does something wrong or they want something from their parents, what do they do? They start doing everything right. They become, they become an angel. All of a sudden you see them doing things they've never done before. They start doing the dishes, they're vacuuming, they're taking out the trash, they're making their beds. You've never seen them do these things, but all of a sudden, because they've done something wrong or they want something from you, they start doing these things to change your perception. 
Bani Umayyah did this, but to a much higher degree. After the killing of Imam Hussein, they began spreading stories. And back then, in that time, there was no news source. There was no Wikipedia. There was no CNN, no newspapers. So how did people find out their news? They found it out through the word of mouth and through storytelling. People would sit in the mosque and in the market, and they would tell these stories. And when they would tell these stories, that is how people found out what was happening. So Bani Umayyah began paying people to say that Nabi Musa was saved on the day of Ashura. That Nabi Adam, Allah forgave him on the day of Ashura. That Nabi Yusuf السلام, was reunited with his father on the day of Ashura. Why? All to paint Ashura in a picture of happiness. So that people would laugh and celebrate on Ashura. They would rejoice in all these happy things happening instead of remembering what Yazid ibn Muawiyah did on the day of Ashura. And this worked deviously well. People forgot. A lot, of, a lot of Muslim brothers and sisters forgot what happened on the day of Ashura. To this day, they don't know what happened on the day of Ashura. In some Muslim countries, there is a figure that is exactly like Santa Claus. They call him Baba Ashura. He goes around on the day of Ashura and he gives out gifts to all the little children. He gives out candy and they have parades and celebrations. It's like another aid for them. And even one time, two years ago, on the day of Ashura, I went to a khutbah to Jum'ah. And the Imam there, the Khatib, he said, I congratulate you on the day of Ashura, on this happy occasion. That even their ulama, their imams, they don't know what happened on the day of Ashura. Now, is this out of pure malice? Is it out of hate? Most of the time, no. 99% of the time, this is out of ignorance. Yes, there is that 1% where maybe they do hate the Ahl al-Bayt and they hate the Imams, so they spread these stories even though they know the truth. But 99% of the time, it's out of ignorance. Because even though it's written in their own books, they don't read their own books. All they hear again is through the word of mouth and their parents and their grandparents and their Imams and the Khatibs and everybody else is telling them that Ashura is a happy occasion. So what do they have to believe that anything, that Ashura is anything but a happy occasion? So how do we, as the Shia, stop this? Do we, as the Shia, stop this by beating on our chests? By screaming? By beating our heads until blood comes out? By beating on our backs with chains? Is this the way we do it? No. The way we do it is as the Shia, we need to educate ourselves on the day of Ashura. We ourselves need to know what Ashura is about. Because when we educate ourselves on Ashura, only then can we educate others. So the next time somebody tells you, you Shia, why do you guys wear black on Ashura? Why, do you guys, why are you guys always crying? Today is the day that Nabi Musa was saved. Today is the day that Nabi Nuh was saved from the flood. Why are you guys crying? Why is, why is it all sadness for you guys? You can educate them. You can tell them what happened to the grandson of the Prophet, what happened to his family on the day of Ashura. My brothers and sisters, on the day of Ashura, Imam Hussein gave the biggest sacrifice. He sacrificed everything he had. He sacrificed himself and his family and his companions. He allowed the woman in his family to be enslaved after his death. Why? So that people would understand the corruption of Bani Umayyah. So that people would recognize the true legacy of his, of his grandfather, the Prophet. So we as his Shia, as his loyal followers, we proclaim ourselves to be his followers, we cannot let this go to waste. We must take what he taught us and teach it to others to make sure that his legacy stands and to make sure that the stain, the corruption of Bani Umayyah that still stains the earth today is wiped off. Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بثنائك وأناخذ ترحلك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين 
وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters, uh, may Allah protect you and bless you. I'd like to welcome you for our first night of Muharram program for this year. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us and continue and hopefully bring more uh, friends and relatives and family members to join us, inshallah, in the future nights. I'd like to thank uh, our dear Ali and dear Muhammad for their recitation and the beautiful speech that we had. Uh, thank you so much. Tonight we are honored, actually this year, we are honored to have our dear brother, Jafar Khazrini, uh, who just uh, arrived from Iraq to be with us for the next 10 nights that we are having programs here. And uh, we welcome him, and we really thank him for being with us this year. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him and protect us very honorable family, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect, to protect all of you. A uh, couple announcements I would like to share with you. Uh, as you know, this pandemic is still going on, and this is the first uh, year we have opened uh, for Muharram after the, uh, the start of uh, the pandemic about a couple years ago. There are certain, uh, you know, uh, rules that we need to follow would be, be better for all of us. And there are gonna be precautionary uh, steps that we need to take. Inshallah for the prayers from tomorrow, if we can have one person at least, like a distance between us and the other person, one person during the prayers. And uh, uh, the chairs that we're gonna put here, they have a good distance with each other. And uh, you know, when we come into the masjid, inshallah, if we can have our masks on until inshallah this whole pandemic gets annihilated and we all freely come and join these programs in the future inshallah. For your health and the health of all the people in the world, please recite the loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. After the, I'm gonna invite our dear brother, uh, Sir Jafar Qazim to the podium, but after the speech, we're gonna have lamentation at the end inshallah. And then uh, please be with us. So with the salawat, let's invite our dear brother Jafar Qazwin to the podium. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullah. My dear respected brothers and sisters, it's my honor and a pleasure to be among you again after a uh, you know, few years of disconnection, alhamdulillah, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded me to serve this community and to serve Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Let's pray that we all be uh, good servants and to serve as much as we can to the uh, master of shuhada, Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Also my thanks to dear brother Samir Amiri and to the beautiful recitation of Sayyid Ali and Sayyid Muhammad who had a beautiful speech. He made my task very challenging every day. So I would like to thank him so much. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيمة. 
قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كرمنا بني آدم وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم على كثير ممن خلقنا تفضيلا صدق الله العلي العظيم This ayah of Surah Al-Isra clearly indicates the value of a human being and consider him as superior to all living things, to all creatures that God the Almighty has created. A human being is considered to be superior and better with more value. The ayah goes like this. We have honored Bani Adam, children of Adam, and we carried them through land and sea and we gave them good sustenance, and we made them better than many of our creatures. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make human being more valuable than other creatures? Because of the task, of the function that, and the responsibility that a human being will carry. Because the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designated a human being to be the center of the universe. Therefore, he created the galaxies, he created the skies and the heavens and earth and the constellations and mountains and everything. And at the end, he created a human being to be all those creations to be at his disposal and to be his servants. So they become subordinate to his will and his pleasure. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has intended. In one ayah, the Almighty Allah says, Allahu alladhi khalaqa as-samawati wal-ard wa anzala min as-samai ma'an li yukhrija bihi fa akhraja bihi min al-thamarati rizqan lakum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created skies and earth and poured down from the sky pure water so you can get thamarat, the sustenance, from what you need. رِزْقًا لَكُمْ وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الْفُلْكَ لِتَجْرِيَ فِي الْبَحْرِ بِأَمْرِهِ And then he created ships so you can travel. You can use it on the seas. وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الْأَنْهَارِ Then he made all the rivers, all the pure waters available for you. وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ دَائِبَيْنِ وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارِ وَآتَاكُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ مَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُ وَإِنْ تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا Has given you everything. All what you see by your eyes, days and nights, moon and sun, these constellations and the entire universe is all at your disposal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it subordinate to you. So you can benefit, so you can enjoy even the malaika, the Almighty, put them at disposal of a human being. Where he tells them, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ When I create him and I blow in him with my own spirit, then you have to bow for him, you have to prostrate. Now, this is a metaphor, a metaphor for subordination, for submission, to the will of a human being. And when shaitan, when Iblis refused to pay respect and subordination to a human, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned him with an eternal curse. The Almighty, when he describes the mankind and how he created him, he says, this is my handicraft. I have created him with my own hands. When he talks to Iblis, tells him, Ya Iblis, ma man qala, Ya Iblis, ma man'aka an tasjuda lima khalaqtu biyaday. 
I have handicraft this a human being. This is my handmade material. Why you have you refused to show your subordination? For that case, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ اللَّعْنَةَ إِلَى يَوْمِ الدِّينَ صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ When the Almighty describes the morphogenesis of a human being, the processes of a creation. This is in Surah Al-Mu'mineen. Now we know the creation of this universe, the mountains, the heavens, the earth, all those planets are much more difficult, many folds more difficult than the creation of a human being. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَخَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ خَلْقِ النَّاسِ Many people don't pay attention that the creation of other objects beside a human being is much more tremendous and more difficult. Yet the Almighty does not marvel when he creates those. But when it comes to human being and he talks in the process the, and describes the process of the creation, you know, until it gets to the point then says the best of the creators while he does not say it does not marvel when he creates you know the rest of the universe the other objects the other creations the angels for example jinns he never marvels but when it comes to human being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala marvels why to signify one important, being, one important point, and that is a human being is the most dignified, the most respected, the most honored creature that God has created. Even when a human being misbehaves, when Benny Adam commits sins and does wrongdoing, the Almighty keeps the doors of repentance open. He does not punish him does not punish us. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ He does not even mention the word sins. He said, oh, those people, oh, those who have incurred excess upon yourself. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Kept the doors of repentance and forgiveness open. Even when the hope is gone, no more hope for the human to correct themselves, the Almighty does not punish them. That does not punish them. Postpone the punishment. Keep postponing and postponing. Where it says, وَلَوْ يُؤَاخِذُ اللَّهُ النَّاسَ بِظُلْمِهِمْ مَا تَرَكَ عَلَيْهَا مِنْ دَابَّةٍ If for our mistakes and our sins, God would want to punish us, then you would not see two rocks, one on top of the others. وَلَكِنْ يُؤَخِّرَهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّةٍ For what reason? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. Because He loves a human. He wants to cherish them. He wants to pamper them. He wants them to seek Him and seek forgiveness until the last moment. Until the last moment that they could. Still He keeps the doors of forgiveness and repentance open to them. Now what are the examples that the Almighty has made human being more valued and superior to other creatures? Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. The ayah continues and says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Then it says, وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ We carried them through land and through seas. How does he carry us through lands and seas? It's through knowledge. The scholars say that this word is again a metaphor for the intellectual capability that the Almighty has given a human being and has deprived the rest of the creatures. You see insan and a human, when you look at its, his life span, you see it's increasing in knowledge. Look at the animals. The animals always follow their own instinct from the time that they are created until the, the time that they die. 
they are born animals, they live animals like an animal, and they die as an animal. No change. You know, I remember when we were kids in the school, in the elementary, they used to teach us, you know, stories of the animals. Kalila wa Dimna, if you if you've heard of that book. One story is about a donkey who, who was born a donkey, lived a donkey, and died as a donkey. So when he died, the animals had a procession for him. They carried him. And then they started to recite this poetry in Arabic. I will translate it. They say, La ja'ala Allah lahu qarara. Asha himaran wa mada himara. He came as a donkey and lived as a donkey and, 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 leave this and left this world as a donkey. Animals stay flat. Even malaika, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preordained them for their functions and if they stay in a horizontal line. You know, their knowledge, their capacity of knowledge does not increase and does not decrease from the time of the creature until the end of their life. Only human being that has a curve, ascending curve. From the time that he's born and he doesn't know anything, his capability for knowledge increases. The intellectual capacity increases. So this ayah is alludes, alluding to the fact that, the, the, that a human being utilizing his intellectual capab capability to ride the seas or even to ride the air, to have these airplanes, how? Utilizing the laws of physics, the laws of aerodynamics, the laws of density, the laws of relativity. So all of these laws and scientists, sciences combined at the disposal of a human being. So one way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a human being preferred over other creatures through that intellectual capability. And the Almighty alludes, that, alludes to that in the Holy Quran when he created Adam. When he created Adam, the Malaika first questioned the wisdom of creation of Adam. Then God tells them because he's a knowledgeable. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا He taught him all the knowledge. Then he asked the Malaika, can you understand? Can you repeat these asma? They said, سُبْحَانَكَ لَا عِلْمَ لَنَا إِلَّا مَا عَلَّمْتَنَا We have no capacity for that knowledge. Then the Almighty tells Adam, قُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ أَنْبِئْهُمْ بِأَسْمَائِهِمْ Then Adam started to Teach the malaika. So number one criteria, number one factor for this preference is through knowledge. The other one, the ulama says, it is that a human being, a human being creates civilization, creates legacy and heritage. You know, we cannot outlive the malaika, the angels, but our legacy, our civilization, our names, our memories can stay forever. Look at from the dawn of history, how many personalities have came who have changed the course of a human history. And their name still is very vivid, is very clear. From the very beginning, look at the prophets, prophets Ibrahim alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam. Look at the scientists, look at the philosophers from the ancient Greek philosophers like Plato and, and Aristotle and Socrates, all the way to the, you know, the Alexander the Great, to the scientists, to Newton, to Einstein, to Ibn Sina, to Fakhr al-Razi, Abu Bakr al-Razi, all those names of scientists, they're gone. Their bodies are gone, but their memories, their legacies are staying, staying forever and above all Sayyid al-Shuhada alayhi salam. Look at his memory after 1400 years of martyrdom, still we commemorate the legacy of Sayyid al-Shuhada alayhi salam as if Ashura happened yesterday. And above him Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The Almighty says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ your name is always mentioned. Over the 
years over the centuries and millennia until the day of judgment, the legacy of a human being always stay alive. And that's another factor that a human beings are preferred. A third one that the scholars say, say that this is the free will of a human being. It is based on a free will that we are considered potentially even better than the malaika. Why? Because angels do not have a propensity for sin. They don't have desire for sin. They are fine-tuned. They are created to be servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A pure intellect. Therefore, they never have any desire to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it comes to human being, the Almighty says that we have created both the desires and the obedience to Allah within the a creation of a human being. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا God has made both the obedient sense, propensity to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and disobey Him in every human being. Therefore, when we overcome our own desires, when we overcome our commanding souls, we elevate ourselves and become better than the malaika. A beautiful saying of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He says, Inna Allah azza wa jal rakkaba bil malaikati aqlan bila shahwa. He installed in the malaika aql, intellect, pure intellect. No desire, nothing like any desire, any lust. Wa rakkaba fil baha'imi shahwatan bila aql. And the animals are all made from desires and no intellect. And intellect. Both of them have been installed in Bani Adam. Someone who has intellect, his mind, overcome his commanding soul, then he is better than the malaika. وَمَنْ غَلَبَتْ شَهْوَتُهُ عَقْلَهُ فَهُوَ أَدْنَى مِنَ الْبَهَائِمِ And someone whose lust and desire overcomes his pure intellect, then he is worse than the animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls those. He says, أُولَٰئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلُّ سَبِيلًا There are other factors that scholars consider a human being better than the rest of the creatures, especially the animals. First of all, they say that he's upright. You know, we stand on two legs instead of the four-legged animals. The other thing, we eat edible food, cooked food, while animals, you know, eat raw and sometimes rotten, some as bad food. Our sustenance is much better than the animals. For example, we use our hands when we eat. The animals use their mouth to eat. But those are, you know, secondary things. But the three points that makes Bani Adam better than the rest of the creatures are those three things that I have mentioned. Now this in regards to the morphogenesis, to the creation of a human being. But what about the loss? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to ensure the dignity of a human being through the scripts, through religions. The Almighty dispa dispatched the messengers, the prophets, 124,000 messengers um, and the prophet. For what reason? He says in Surah Al-Hadith, for one reason, only one reason. He says that, وَلَقَدْ لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ we sent, we dispatched our prophets with evidences, with books, scriptures. وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ We sent books and mizan, justice. For what reason? Only one, لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ So people can stand up for justice. Justice for whom? Justice for God or for justice for themselves? Definitely for themselves. God needless of someone to come and protect the rights of God. 
but he wanted people to protect each other's rights, each other to be fair to each other, to be just to each other. The whole purpose of religion is that we regulate our relationship among ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in need, it does not need, is needless of our worship and our prayers. The ayah says, in takfuru antum woman fil ardi jami'an fa inna allaha la ghaniyun hameed. If your entire universe, entire humanity become apostate, nothing will hurt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's left hurtless, so harmless. So the whole purpose of religions, of those holy commands, is to protect the right of a human, to be fair so we can be fair to each other. Therefore, you see that there are so many verses came to protect the dignity of a human being plain a human being, in regard of what faith and what color and what ethnicity they are. Ya ayyuhal ladheena aman, ujtanibu kathiran min al-dhan, inna ba'd al-dhan ithm, wa la tajassasu, wa la yakhtab ba'dukum ba'da. These are all commands for what purpose? So we respect each other, we dignify each other. So our dignity is preserved and safeguarded. In another ayah says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu la yaskhar qawmun min qawm. Asa an yakunu khayran minum. In another one says, Wa la tanabazu bil alqab. Don't use bad words. Don't use name calling. In one verse says that if you kill a single life, innocent life, as if you have killed the entire humanity. Man qatala nafsan bighayri nafsan aw fasadin fil ard. فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا As if you have killed the entire humanity. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. In his beautiful sermon says, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ آدَمْ لَمْ يَلِدْ عَبْدًا وَلَا أَمَنْ Adam, when he proliferated, when he delivered babies, when he gave offspring, he didn't give any slave or any mate. لم يلد عبدا ولا أما وإنما ولد ذريته كلهم أحرار. All of his offsprings were free people. كلما نظرت إلى كتاب الله, he says, whatever, whenever I look at the Quran وسنة رسوله, فلم أجد لبني إسماعيل فضلا على بني إسحاق. I never see that. One descendant of one family, Bani Ismail, have preference over other sects, other descendants of Bani Ishaq, meaning that all humanity are equal. No one can enslave others. Look, this had been said 1400 years ago. Now we see the rants and the bragging about, you know, black life matters and those things after 1400 years. Islam has declared the human dignity and human rights long time, 14 centuries ago, in the Holy Quran, in the words of the Prophet, in the words of the Imams, alayhim salam, and they have stressed upon that. Now, what does happen that the human dignity get demolished, get trampled? What are the factors that we lose our dignities? Number one is a personal factor a self-inflected thing. I myself do not preserve my own dignity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated a human being to the point that he addressed them, talked to them, revealed his revelation to them. It is unbecoming, unfitting that a human being commits sins, denigrating himself, bringing himself, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ then he chooses to condescend to the rock bottom and comes to lower himself, to chase his lust, to be so weak and instead in, his, in the front of his commanding soul, not to have self-esteem. This is one problem that many people have, a personal factor that we do not protect our own dignity and our self-respect. Al-Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam 
says ما أقبح بالمؤمن أن تكون له رغبة تذله what a bad thing that a believer has a certain kind of lust that makes him humiliated after all, all the time is chasing that lust going after that always thinking of the worldly matters that reduces the value of a human being that brings down the human being to a lower level ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ This is one factor that we, as a human, we incur upon ourselves. Other forms, political form. And mashallah, the Islamic history is full of that. How many tyrants we had. How many despot, how many dictators we used to have throughout the Islamic history and other people's history, not only Islamic histories. Mass killing, torture, denigrating people in order for them to control the masses, they denigrate them. They humiliate them. Quran talks about Pharaoh. says, فَاسْتَخَفَّ قَوْمَهُ فَأَطَاعُوا He denigrated them, insulted their integrity and their dignity. Therefore, he enslaved them. They listened to him. When you denigrate someone, that person becomes an object. No longer a human being. All means of torture, of killing, of self-incrimination, forcing people to commit to, to, to um, you know, to acknowledge that they have committed crimes and so forth. And that's a plenty of it you see in, the, in our Islamic governments, unfortunately, throughout history and even now. Look at the... Muslim population, look at the population in every single Islamic country. What kind of a state they have? Do they have a freedom of thought? Can they speak? Can they say something? There is a famous joke. You know, here not, we are here not to you know, mention these jokes, but it is relevant to the subject. They say one day there was an international contest between the intelligence services of each country. For example, the CIA, the Mossad, the KGB, the M16. They wanted to see which one can find, you know, or, or which one is more capable of finding the adversaries. If something is missing, someone is missing, how they can find him. So they chose a bunny, a rabbit, and threw him in the jungle, left him in the jungle. So each service, each intelligence service will come and find this bunny. So they took the bunny, at 8 a.m., they dump in, in the jungle, and after one hour, the CIA agent came and they found the bunny. They said, this is the bunny. Salawat, you need to make salawat. Allahumma <laughs> salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Then it came the turn of Mossad, the Israeli intelligent. Again, they took the bunny. They dump him in the jungle at 9 o'clock. By 10 a.m., the Mossad found him, and they brought him alive to the you know, to the people who were in charge of this contest. Then it was the turn of F F M16, the, the, the British intelligence. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right. M16? MI6. MI6, sorry. MI6. So again, you know, within three hours, four hours, they brought the, the bunny. Then it came the turn of one of these, you know, intelligence services of an Islamic country. So they dumped the bunny, they went after and searched, you know, they kept searching and searching, became noon, afternoon, evening, at night, late night. Eventually they came pulling an elephant to bring in an elephant with them. The elephant is bloodied, you know, uh, uh, his tusk is broken, his trunk is mutilated. They brought them and they said, this is the, this is the bunny. They said, this is an elephant. What are you calling? How are you calling this is a bunny? I said, well, just ask him. So they went and asked this poor elephant, are you a bunny? He said, listen, I am a bunny. My father is a bunny. My mom is a bunny. My entire family are bunny. But just leave me alone, for God's sake. From the time that they captured me, they started beating me and telling me that you have to, conf to confess that you are a bunny. This is the story of our own Islamic states, unfortunately. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says, for those who cannot practice their thought freely, who cannot do their activities freely, they have to leave that country. قَالُوا فِيمَ كُنْتُمْ قَالُوا كُنَّا مُسْتَضْعَفِينَ فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا أَلَمْ تَكُنْ أَرْضُ اللَّهِ وَاسِعَةً فَتُهَاجِرُوا فِيهَا The land of Allah is a huge, vast. Why do you stay in a place that you are your dignity has been taken away and there is an insult to your integrity. You're not supposed to stay in that land. You need to leave. Even if there is a cave, you see Ahlul Kahf, they were affluent people, they were government officials. Eventually when the ruler forced them to worship idols, they went to the Kahf, to the cave. قالوا the the ayah says, فَأُوْ إِلَى الْكَهْفِ يَنْشُرْ لَكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ مِنْ رَحْمَتِهِ وَيُهَيِّئْ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَمْرِكُمْ مَرْفَقَ Even if it's a cave, go take refuge to the cave. Don't stay in such society. So this is a second factor. The third factor, brothers and sisters, when it becomes a religious factor. When religion comes to denigrate and to attack your dignity, and your integrity. That's the most dangerous one. This is what has happened after the death of the, of, of the Prophet, peace be upon him. After the departure of the Prophet, because the government wanted to control people. Bani Umayyah wanted to control the masses. They wanted to force the masses for, with their own will. In which way? In institutionalizing and legitimizing their actions through which method? Through a hadith, fabricated narrations from the Prophet, peace be upon him, harboring certain, those certain hadith narrators and storytellers, harboring them, paying them money to fabricate such kind of, you know, a hadith, bogus narrations from the Prophet to force people to listen to those you know, dictators and those ruthless rulers. And one, one of the, in one of those bogus, bogus hadith is Hudayfa ibn, is, is they, they're narrating from Hudayfa. Hudayfa was an excellent person. But the narrator uses Hudayfa to say this word. He says, one day I listened to the Prophet and, sub, and the Prophet says, سَيَكُونُ مِنْ بَعْدِي أُمَّةً لَا يَهْتَدُونَ بِهُدَاءِ They don't listen to me. There are rulers who will come after me who are not following my own tradition. وَلَا يَسْتَنُّونَ بِسُنَّتِي وَسَيَقُومُ فِيهِمْ رِجَالٌ قُلُوبُهُمْ قُلُوبُ الشَّيَاطِينَ Their hearts, it's like a shaitan, like Iblis. فِي جُثْمَانِ إِنسَان But their body is from insan. Then we ask the Prophet, so what should we do when we have such kind of rulers? He said, Tasma' wa tuti' wa in daraba dahrak wa akhada malak. You would listen and follow. Even if it's, you know, he hits you, even if he confiscates your belonging, your wealth, you need to listen. You need to follow. You should be obedient to those rulers. And here we see the wisdom of the revolution of Imam Hussein alayhi salam to restore the human dignity that was lost, that was obliterated by Bani Umayyah. What did Bani Umayyah do? You know, you need to look throughout the history of Bani Umayyah, especially Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, to see what kind of act he did to human dignity. Those, this part that we have today, their godfather is Muawiyah. He's the one who taught them all these oppression methods, all these techniques to suppress the populations. There wasn't any illegal method that he did not take to suppress the people, to eliminate his opposition from Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, to Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, to Malik al-Ashtar, to many other people and companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he gave them venom an outlawed venom that even was not supposed to be used in the Roman Empire. He used them against the Sahaba and killed them. And then he used to say, Inna lillahi junoodun min asal. God has certain army, and this army is asal. He would take 
honey, mix it with the, with the venom, and send it to those personality, those people. He would declare to all his rulers throughout the Islamic countries, anyone who mentioned one, even one single virtue of Ali ibn Abi Talib, you need to take him and you completely raise him to ground. Kill him. Buri'at al dhamma Here it says, Buri'at al dhamma Liman yanqulu man qabatan li Abi Turab. Even if you mention a single virtue of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, you risk your own life, your family life. This is how he used to govern. Ziyad ibn Abi, one of his rulers in Basra. One day he announced curfew. There was a revolution against Muawiyah. He announced a curfew after Salat al-Isha, after the prayer of Isha and said whoever comes from his house, he will be beheaded. On the first now, in the first night, he beheaded 900 people. On the second night, he beheaded 50 people. And on the third night, he beheaded one person. And the entire population was subdued. Now you wonder why we have so many little narrations narrated from Imam al-Hassan, from Imam al-Hussein, from Ali ibn Abi Talib, for what reason? Because the, um, the environment that Bani Umayyah has, have created was suffocating environment. If you mention a single narration from Al Imam Al Hassan or Imam Al Hussein, you would risk your own life. Therefore, we, when you look at the literature, the Islamic heritage and Islamic literature, you see only a bunch of narrations that is left from Imam al-Hassan, compared to Imam al-Baqir compared to Imam al-Sadiq, for example, for this suffocating environment that Bani Umayyah have created. Then came Yazid. Yazid was an outright kafir, Muawiyah pretending to be a Muslim, a follower, but in reality he was a munafiq. But Yazid was an outright kafir from the very beginning, and it clearly, he would marvel about his sins and wrongdoings when he sent the message to the governor of Medina to take a pledge, a pledge, pledge from Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam to pledge allegiance to Yazid. The governor of Medina called upon Al Hussein alayhi salam, brought him to his home, to his house, to ask for the bay'ah. At that time, the Imam alayhi salam stood up stood up and set up an equation, or in fact, the non-equation. What did he say? He said, أَيُّهَا الْأَمِيرُ إِنَّا أَهْلُ بَيْتِ النُّبُوَّةِ وَمَوْضِعُ الرِّسَالَةِ وَمَخْتَلَفِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَبِنَا فَتَحَ اللَّهُ وَبِنَا يَخْتِمْ We are the household of prophethood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised us in the household of the prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened this creation with our own names. We are Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet, peace be upon him. وَيَزِيدْ رَجُلٌ فَاسِقْ شَارِبٌ لِلْخَمْرِ قَاتِلٌ لِلنَّفْسِ الْمُحْتَرَمَةِ قَاتِلٌ لِلنَّفْسِ الْمُحْتَرَمَةِ مُعْلِنٌ بِالْفِسْقِ Four things he mentions about Yazid. وَمِثْلِي لَا يُبَايُعُ مِثْلَهِ Someone in my caliber will never pledge allegiance to someone in the caliber of Yazid. This is the equation, or the non-equation that Imam Hussein alayhi salam said. This is the formula. Someone in my position would never ever make allegiance to someone like Yazid. When he came to Karbala in the mid-road, when Hur ibn Yazid stopped him with his army, he narrated this hadith. He said, Ayyuhan nas, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says this hadith. Man ra'a sultanan ja'iran mustahallan li huram Allah. Nakithan li ahdi Allah. Nakithan li ahdi Allah. Mukhalifan li sunnati Rasulullah. Ya'amalu fi ibadillahi bil ithmi wal udwan. Thumma lim yugayyir. Biqawlin wala bifi'l. Kana haqqan ala Allah an yudkhilahu madkhala. Whoever see a tyrant. Who opposes the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the tradition of Ahlul Bayt, tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and 
creates animosity and hatred among population and he keeps silent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment will re reincarnate him with that person. I am, I am the first one to uprise and revolt against this man. Now, Al Imam Al Hussein had a choice either to pledge allegiance to Yazid or facing death. In his word, he says, He made me to choose between two things. Either if I have to fight or humility. Nothing else. And we never allow obedience to such kind of people, such kind of ruthless, ruthless people and rulers to our martyrdom. No, we will go, we will fight until we die. In his word, he says, أَلَا تَرَوْنَ إِلَى الْحَقِّ لَا يُعْمَلُ بِهِ وَإِلَى الْبَاطِلِ لَا, يت... لا يُتَنَاهَا عَنْ لِيَرْغَبَ الْمُؤْمِنْ فِي لِقَاءِ رَبِّهِ مُحِقًّا أَلَا وَإِنِّي لَا أَرَى الْمَوْتِ إِلَّا سَعَادَةً وَالْحَيَاةِ مَعَ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا بَرَمَ My happiness in death. When I have to choose between Yazid and live among Yazid and his followers or to die, my happiness is death. I would choose. I would choose death. A dignified death. A death that is keeps my head high and keeps my memory alive on the day of Ashura. When he gave all his companions and households as massacres and sacrificials in front of Allah, he was alone by himself. He was fighting until the last breath on that moment when he stopped to breathe for one second, to rest one, for one second. A rock came and hit his forehead as he left the shirt to wipe the blood. An arrow came and penetrated his heart. The arrow penetrated his heart. He did his best to take the arrow away, but he could not. He leaned against the saddlebag of the horse. He made the arrow get out of his back. He pulled the arrow and the, and the blood started to gush. He took the first chunk of the blood and washed his face. And he said, I want the prophet, my grandfather, my mom, Fatima to Zahra on the day of judgment to see me with this stained blood. So I can tell my grandfather who has killed me, who has oppressed me. In that moment, he lost his ability to stand on the force. So he was tilting. As he tilts toward right, the horse also tilts toward right. As he tilts toward left, the horse also tilts toward left to keep his master on his shoulder. Then he looks at the horse and tells him, Ya Jawad, la taqata li ala al julus ala dhaharik. I can no longer stay on my on your shoulder. Da'ni asqutu ala wajh al ard. Allow me to fall on the ground. And Hussein fell on the ground. One of the way that he kept the camp, the woman in the camp to know about him is through his screams. He would shout and scream when he killed the enemies. At one, and one, at one moment, there was a silence. Then at that time, Zainab came out and says, Mali la ara libni walidi shakhsan. I don't see my brother. Wala asma'u lahu sawta. I can't, hear, I can't hear his voice. One of the ladies told her, maybe, maybe the enemy, enemy had become a divide between us and him. 
That's why we cannot see him. He said, she said, Hasha libni walidi. Antadummahu khaylun wala rijal. No, ibn walidi, my brother would not leave us alone. She came out in the battlefield. She saw Hussein, her Hussein on the ground. She declared, Hussein, Ukhaya Hussein. She didn't hear a reply. Again, she screamed, Habibi Hussein. She didn't hear anything. Then she said, Hussein, Aqsamtu alayka bihaq ummi Fatima. I mentioned the name of Fatima upon you. If you hear me, answer me. At that time, Hussein opened his eyes, looked at her, Ukhaya Zainab, what do you do? She said, In kunta hayyan fa'adrikna. If you are still alive, come to our rescue. The enemy has attacked us. وَإِن كُنْتَ مَيِّتًا فَأَمْرُنَا وَأَمْرُكَ إِلَى اللَّهِ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك وأناخت برحلك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة 